Hello, I'm Dr. Margaret Hogan. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Portland, where I hold the McNerney Hansen Chair in Ethics. The topic of these lectures will be medical ethics in the Catholic tradition. The first two lectures will focus on the, the question of foundations. The work of the first two lectures will put the foundations of medical ethics in the Catholic tradition in place. Consideration of the foundations is essential if the discussion is not to be reduced to casuistry or situation ethics, and if the tradition is to serve as a guide for issues not yet within the contemporary horizon. So the starting point will be the background out of which Catholic medical ethics grew. That background will include its sources in ancient Greece and Rome and the philosophical and medical tradition there in Judaism and in Christianity. Then I will situate the contemporary situation in which medical ethics has been pulled apart from the religious tradition, and then I will affirm the need of the religious tradition to claim its rightful place in medical ethics. The tradition is a rich one whose material elements are drawn from revelation, from the teaching magisterium, and from sound medical practices and scientific research, and whose formal elements are derived from ethical principles, from the natural law tradition, and from legal theory, as all of these intersect to serve the human good and the human pilgrimage through life and by death into eternal life. After the determination of the tradition, the second lecture will present the general principles, followed by a listing of some of the more specific principles that guide reasoning in this field. So first, the historical background. Thinking of the appropriateness or the inappropriateness, the morality of medical intervention is as old as the human race. For centuries, these discussions of, of medical intervention were carried on as embedded within a religious tradition. In the world of classical antiquity, in Greece, in Egypt, and in Rome, medicine was practiced under the guidance of the gods, and they were invoked to heal and to assist in healing. Judaism, and later Christianity, and even later still, Islam, the religions that, that revere the scriptures, found in the books of the scriptures the wisdom to guide human life and the practices which serve human flourishing. The traditions of the book share an important set of truths, including life as a gift of God, of human life as lived in covenant with God, and of people called to exercise stewardship in the image of God, creative stewardship in the created world. While there are some differences within these traditions, there are important truths that they hold in common. In ancient Greece and in ancient Rome, the practice of medicine was a priestly art connected with Aesculapius. The symbol of Aesculapius became and continues to be the symbol of the practice of medicine. The Code of Hippocrates, which dates from the 5th century BC, has long been associated, has long associated healing with the priestly office. In it, the physician prays, acknowledges debt to those who transmitted the art of medicine, and swears to use treatment, and I quote, to help the sick according to my ability and judgment, and never with a view to injury and wrongdoing. Neither will I administer a poison to anyone when asked to do so. Similarly, I will not give a woman a pessary for abortion. I will keep pure and holy both my life and my art. I will enter a house to help the sick, and I will abstain from all wrongdoing and harm, especially from abusing the bodies of men or women, bond or free. And whatever I see or hear in the course of my profession, in my intercourse with men, if it be what should not be published abroad, I will never divulge holding such things to be holy secrets. While the oath itself contains much more, and the Hippocratic oath contains more, and the Hippocratic corpus contains more than the oath, there may be noted, at least in incohate form, the ends and the limits of medicine. Among them are the following the positive goal to help the sick, and the negative limit to cause no injury, the separation of killing from curing in the role of the physician, 
the universality of the application of the practice to men and women, whether free or slave, and the obligation to confidentiality. In the Jewish tradition, medicine was practiced and still is practiced out of the steadfast fidelity to the covenant with God and the covenant to life, Lachaim. In both Moses of Mount Sinai and in Moses Maimonides, who were often referred to as the temporal poles of the golden age of Judaism, there is to be found the combination of healing power and priestly office. The staff with a single snake coiled around the shaft of the staff is recorded to have had healing power. Moses Maimonides, the Jewish philosopher physician who practiced medicine in a regnant Muslim society from Cordova in Spain to Morocco and finally in the Sultan's court at Cairo, wrote in the 12th century a prayer that is often considered to contain a moral code for the practice of medicine. In the prayer of Maimonides, the following are noted. The acknowledgement by the physician of dependence upon God. The practice of medicine as informed by love of God. The practice directed to the good of the patient and practices des uh, described and limited to the care of life and health and the preservation of life and health. The universal application of the art of medicine to rich and poor, to friend and foe, the recognition of the distinction between the physical and the spiritual, the tie of the practice of medicine to truth and to love, and the warning against those things such as desire for profit and ambition for renown that detract from the practice of medicine. In the Christian tradition, the material elements that inform the Christian tradition, the most important of these are those that are rooted in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament accounts of the ministry of Jesus and those that are rooted in the teaching magisterium of the church, which is entrusted with presenting the meaning of scripture in each age. Among the most frequently recurring stories of the New Testament are those of the healing miracles of Jesus. The healing ministry of Christ is part of the identity of the Catholic physician and all who would be called to practice medicine in the Catholic tradition. The tradition cites rightly as, as its apotheme to heal as Jesus healed, and the tradition ought to appropriate that apotheme into practice. Examples of the healing of Jesus abound in the scriptures. The healing of the leper, the healing of the servant of the centurion, the healing of the mother-in-law of Peter, the restoration of sight, the restoration of bodily integrity, the restoration of life, the restoration of speech and of mobility. It is said in the Gospel of Matthew that in this healing mission, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. He took away our infirmities and bore our diseases. Yet Jesus as healer of physical illness is just one of the dimensions of his healing power. His radical healing ministry extended beyond the healing of bodily infirmity. He healed those who suffered from sin as well as those who suffer from physical infirmity. He drove out demons, he forgave sinners, and condemned hypocrisy. Medical practice worthy of the name Catholic would, through appropriate partnering with clergy, keep alive the multidimensional healing that our fallen human nature requires. The Muslim tradition of medicine, which flourished in the Middle Ages, was renowned for its technical skills and its intellectual advances. Medicine was practiced within an ethical code derived from Islamic teaching and philosophy. God was acknowledged as the author of life and death. Physicians were admonished that they do not have control of life or death. Those who were physicians had great, grave obligations to be expert in their art, to be humanitarian in the distribution of their practices, to respect human life, to keep confidences, and to do no harm. The physician philosopher Avicenna is among the most famous of the Eastern Islamic scholars of the medieval period. He integrated religion and science and philosophy into his medical works. His canon of medicine was considered the standard medical text 
in Europe and Asia until the 17th century. In the canon, he described medicine as the art whereby health is conserved and the art whereby health is restored after having been lost. The Islamic Code of, of Medical Professional Ethics continues this same tradition and calls for Muslim physicians to practice medicine within the framework of belief in God and belief in Islamic teaching. They look to the Quran to inspire the Muslim physician in practice and to keep before the physician the obligations and limits of the practice in, in the practice of medical art. In an oath which bears some similari similarity to the oath of Hippocrates, the Muslim physician makes these commitments to acknowledge his faith and his dependence upon God, to be grateful to his teachers and parents, to be competent in his field, to remember that human life which begins at conception is a gift from God, to refrain from administering anything harmful to a patient, to respect his patient by appropriate communication, and by keeping confidential information about the patient, to be modest in his practice, and to seek wisdom. Catholic physicians readily embraced with, embraced with appropriate modifications the commitments articulated in the Code of Hippocrates, and the Catholic traditions continue to keep its tradition alive through careful examination in the light of the tradition, the practices of medicine, and the gains of science through the timely study of these and through publication of the results of these studies. The Pontifical Institute of Science, which was established in 1936 and which traces its ancestry to the Academia Lynchiae, established in 1603, and whose international membership includes renowned scientists, Catholic and non-Catholic alike, among them many Nobel laureates, is committed to the study of the advances of science so that science and religion may advance together to serve human good. In recent years, the Academy has addressed such issues as the environment, neurological research, human fertility, the origin and evolution of life, the formation of galaxies in the young universe, the beginning of life, the implications of genetics, and food needs of the developing world. In addition to the Pontifical Academy, bishops of various national conferences study through commissions created for just that purpose, issues in the practice of medicine, and put forth guidelines to assist in the formation of individual conscience and of institutional conscience. The religious and ethical directives for Catholic health care institutions prepared by the National Conference of Catholic Bishops in the United States provide one example of the ongoing efforts of the tradition to interact with and to transform the contemporary world. The document presents 70 directives to guide the Catholic community in respect to appropriate health care. The directives are ordered about around six themes of social responsibility, of pastoral and spiritual responsibility, of the relationship between the Catholic healthcare professional and the patient, of care at the beginning of life, of care at the end of life, and of the formation of healthcare alliances. Each of those religious traditions, Jewish, Catholic, and Islamic, continues to inform the practices and the institutions of those who claim the tradition as their own. Nevertheless, the informing role of the religious traditions in the practice of medicine does not continue without challenge. In the last quarter of the 20th century, a deliberate effort was made to separate bioethics from religious commitment and to develop a more general and hence more universal set of ethical principles to guide medical ethics. The more general principles included such sets of principles as beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, informed consent, and justice. These principles were thought sufficient to direct a value-free science and a value-free medicine for a pluralistic polity. Furthermore, these principles were wedded to a particular enlightenment and Western liberal account of human life 
that has as its core an inadequate philosophy of person, a philosophy which values an excessive individualism fueled by the will, unfettered by truth, of the autonomous rights-bearing individual, and which respects only those individuals who are capable of exercising autonomous rights. These principles are so general as to be empty. The myth of a value-free science and medicine collapsed in the wake of the revelation and the subsequent findings of the Nuremberg trial, of the Japanese Unit 731 biological warfare experiments, and of the Tuskegee studies. The underlying philosophy of person is a form of elitism which denies protection to those who are not like those in power. A more, ad a more adequate philosophy of person reveals that we live our lives more often as related, dependent human beings. Autonomy is always a limited accomplishment achieved over time, if at all and achieved only after a long period of dependency and often followed by another period of dependency. Autonomy is always limited, constrained by the relationships which define one's lives, and those relationships often require acceptance of disadvantage by the powerful for the sake of the dependent. Human beings are dependent in the most absolute and radical way, first upon God and then upon each other. Living a rich human life places us in different relationships to each other throughout life. Some of these relationships are symmetrical and some are asymmetrical. The symmetrical relationships have their source in our being related to one another in fundamental equality as human beings. The asymmetrical relationships have their source in the fundamental inequality that we have on account of the obligations and duties that arise in our different vocations whereby we serve one another. In those relationships which are asymmetrical, such as physician-patient, professor-student, attorney-client, the model is God's relationship to God's creatures. They are asymmetrical because one party to the relationship has knowledge, which is the source of power and authority and the other party in the relationship is in need of this authority and power. These relationships have definition and give content to rights and duties. The physician, the professor, the attorney exercises authority over the patient, the student, the client. On the other hand, the patient, the student, the client has the right to the appropriate competence of that authority. Out of that competence and within the limits of that role, physicians serve the good of patients, professors serve the good of students, the attorney serves the good of the client. The patient, the student, the client submits to that authority until that authority is no longer needed. The exercise of power and authority is to be merciful, compassionate, and just as God is merciful, compassionate, and just. So in the failure now of the bioethics of the last quarter of the 20th century, in the 21st century, the religious traditions are called upon to recover their role as informing practices and institutions that they claim to be their own. Dr. Edmund Pellegrino, for many years, a leader among Catholic physicians and in Catholic medical care, speaking to and of the tradition of Catholic medicine and health care, often cites the words of Kierkegaard to remind medical practitioners of their calling to imitate Christ. Kierkegaard said, without imitation of Christ, the fruit of Catholic faith, Christianity becomes mere mythology or poetry or an abstract idea. The Catholic physician then is called to imitate Christ to heal as Christ healed. Moreover, the Catholic tradition is reminded of its limits. Healing of physical illness is not always possible. The bodies of this temporal life are mortal and corruptible. Hence, an exclusive focus on healing is too narrow and too exclusive a center. It is to buy into what Stanley Hauerwas calls 
the Promethean myth of modern medicine that offers the promise of human salvation and more and better medicine. Jesus healed, but he also suffered and died. Here, Catholic medical practices and Catholic healthcare institutions and Catholic patients have special obligations because of the Jesus who is revealed in the scriptures. Catholic practices and Catholic institutions must embrace methods and must be places of caring for the dying that is inevitable. And they must offer visible witnesses to both the truth of the finitude and to the truth of the promise of human existence. In his suffering and in his dying, Jesus, from the depths of his humanity, called out for consolation. In Gethsemane, he asked to be rescued. My father, take this cup of suffering from me. He revealed to his friends his grief and his anguish. He said, the sorrow in my heart is so great that it almost crushes me. He asked his friends to stay with them, with him, and he is sorely disappointed by their, by their failure to remain with him. He experienced abandonment and sorrow, and close to the end, he cried out to his heavenly father, 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 why have you forsaken me? And at last, he placed himself into his father's care. Catholic health care institutions have to be places and have to provide services and spaces within which human beings who are experiencing crushing sorrow, anguish, and abandonment will find in attendance people to touch, people to wash, and people to anoint their bodies, attentive people who will not turn away from them, loving people whose simple presence sustains them, and faithful people who will not abandon them in their dying. And Catholic people who are dying must come to terms finally with human nature as created. They must accept their dying in the hope of eternal life and in the end, reach out to God's infinite power. The Catholic tradition values the limits of the contributions of medicine and science and law, but it does not turn over its moral authority in medical ethics to the success of medical practice, to advances in the science, or to current renderings in the law. Technologies honed by medicine and science and public policies crafted within the law must serve the dignity and vocation of the human person. There is a very long history of scientific and medical research propelled by the research imperative that treated human beings simply as ends of progress and ends of therapeutic goals. Religious authorities must respond appropriately and respectfully to scientific and medical advances when they present opportunities for genuine human flourishing. Church leaders have on more than one occasion stepped inappropriately into the domain of science, and scientists have more often than once sought refuge in the claim that its positions are value-free. Both sides, in careful application of the canons appropriate to their respective fields, must accept the limitation of their expertise. Authority exercised rightly recognizes the power of the dialectical tension between fields and discipline and between theory and practice in the pursuit of truth. Moreover, authority is not recognized for its own sake or for the sake of power, but for the sake of truth. Recent history has witnessed from both sides of the coin, both from the side of science and from the side of the, of the church, the incredible result of appropriate collaboration and cooperation. One particular example of such cooperation is to be found in Directive 58 in the Religious and Ethical Directives for Catholic Health Care. Directive 58 asserts a presumption in favor of providing food and water to patients as long as food and water provides a benefit to the patient, the obligation of ordinary care. The advance in the directives was accomplished by the careful testimony of physicians, theologians, and philosophers. Physicians offered their medical judgment that there are some conditions of illness and decline in which food and water no longer benefit the person, hence they become extraordinary care. 
philosophers and theologians offered their expertise in the careful application of the distinction between ordinary and extraordinary means of preserving human life and in their affirmation of life as a fundamental value and in the distinguishing of the continuation of biological life from the continuation of human existence. With this background in place now, the next lecture will develop the general and specific principles that guide Catholic healthcare and Catholic medical ethics.